Yep. Uh, All we're, right. Yeah. Now's the time. Get after it. We are we are going to attack we're this, going this to totem pole this model of yours. Okay, so For, first of all, what do you actually call it? Is it called it's totem called pole? The, it's called the Czech totem pole. Okay. Yeah. So so what is it? How did you develop it? And, and wh it's a beautiful model. Thank you. By the way, so what does it all mean though? And by the way, we're gonna have we're gonna give you access to this. Yeah, the, there's a PDF of this on the yeah. show notes. So if you just go to barbershop.com slash check c h e k, then you can download the PDF and see what we're talking about. Okay, so. Here's what happened. First of all, when I got out of the Army, I, I needed to get a license to practice professionally, and I wanted to study sports massage therapy. So I did research all over the United States to see who had the best sports massage therapy school. And the one that I felt was the best, based on my knowledge and investigation and to what I wanted to learn, was the Sports Massage Training Institute in, and it was in either Costa Mesa or Encinitas. They had two, and it was owned by a lady named Mike Hungerford, who was a Russian-trained massage therapist. And I don't know if you know this, but it takes seven years of training in Russia to get your massage therapy license, and they're mm. treated as equal to medical doctors in wow. Russia. Wow. Dang, I didn't know it. Yeah. So when I went to the Sports Massage Training Institute, it was a very good school, very comprehensive, multiple teachers that were practicing professionals, and it covered joint mobilization, stretching, a wide variety of techniques, Syriax deep tissue therapy, corrective techniques. It was 350 hours of very good, high-quality, intensive training. And there, because massage, at that time, there was like five massage therapy schools in San Diego alone. If you open up the San Diego paper and go to the massage therapy section, there's like five, maybe ten. 10 rows of massage therapists. So the point is, the market was just flooded with massage therapists in town. So I thought, well, the only way I'm going to make a living is to specialize in problem cases. So I just had a deep sense of trust because I'd had such great work with the boxers and gotten such acclaim from my work with the boxers and uh, accolades from generals and from medical doctors working with the sports teams and, and they shit. They said, Paul, since you've been the trainer of the team, our injury rates dropped down to almost nothing compared to before you started. And I said I did two years of training with an osteopathic physician. So I already had an inner sense that I could help a lot of people because I could see what was being missed in all these traditional therapeutic approaches, just like I got the job working at Sports and Orthopedic Physical Therapy. She actually hired me away from the a chiropractic office where I worked for a guy named Dr. Keith Jeffers who specialized in, in athletes, but especially running athletes. And he was one of the teachers in school and he had an Achilles problem that nobody could figure out. So when I fixed him up, he said, I want you to come work for me. And so um, what I did is I went all over San Diego. I made up business cards and brochures and I went to every doctor, every physical therapist, every chiropractor and even massage therapist I could find and said, give me the toughest patients you got. Give me the people that when you look on your schedule and you see that person's name, you go, oh, not them again because they're not responding to therapy and you got nothing to lose. Yeah. And I would offer a money back guarantee. If I didn't give you results that you were happy with, I'd give you your money back. I've been doing that most of my career. So I started getting all these patients and I, after a while, I started, you know, having a list of people that would, would vouch for me. So, yes, this guy's for real because I'd rehabilitated them. And some of them were doctors and physical therapists. So the point is I built this practice of very complicated people. I mean, some of these people would come to me with two medical files, two inches thick. And it would take me a week to read all the studies, all the blood samples, all the x-rays, scanogram, you name it, uh, MRIs. I'd have to study a lot because they were very complicated people. So after a few years of this and having these complicated people, I started saying, Jesus, Murphy, this person's got this chronic back pain. They've seen 50 chiropractors. They've seen neurologists. So I started saying, what's missing? What's missing? And, and so then I would start studying, like I said, what, can, what influences the low back? So you find, for example... If when a woman's premenstrual and the uterus is inflamed, they chronic they have chronic commonly have back pain and their legs get weak and their core stability goes down because the uterus reflexes through the entire sciatic distribution all the way to the toes right to the belly button, 
it affects the suboccipital region, and women oftentimes have a hard time keeping their atlas in position when they're premenstrual because of the effects of estrogen, and the atlas is the most unstable vertebra in the body. So if your structure is not well aligned, it pops out and it pinches the spinal cord and causes all sorts of problems. So what I would do is I would start saying, okay, well, this system connects to that. This woman's got menstrual dysregulation. What causes menstrual? Okay, it, diet and lifestyle factors, caffeine, some of the things we're talking about. So I started noticing that if somebody has a uterus problem, that you cannot rehab them from an ACL injury if their uterus is inflamed because they can't stabilize. If you've got back problems, you can't do it because the, infl- because the organs have a reflex control of the muscles. And, and I learned this studying Byron Robinson, MD's book, The Abdominal and Pelvic Brain, that I just showed you, the first edition, 1899, yeah. second edition, 1907. I studied a lot of old medical books because back then those doctors were actually doing research to help people not to make money. There's a big difference. You understand that? Mm-hmm. They weren't being paid by people to prove that some drug or some machine or some gadget worked. So they were doing honest research. So a lot of the older medical books are loaded with fantastic stuff. So then I I came to the conclusion, okay, I need to look into organs. And what I found studying Byron Robinson MD's work is that the autonomic nervous system is designed so that whenever there's inflammation or stress in an organ, it will down-regulate the flow of, uh, of blood to any muscle on the same nerve channel because organs borrow their sensory neurons from the musculoskeletal system, which is why when a person's having a heart attack, they feel the pain in their chest and the left arm. No one says, my heart hurts. They have terrible pain in their chest and their left arm. The uterus borrows its sensory nerve endings from the lower segments of the uh, sympathetic chain system, which feed the legs, for example, and the lower abdomen and the back. So what Robinson showed way back then is that if there's ever a competition between muscles and organs for blood supply, nutrients, and waste removal, the autonomic system will starve out the muscles to make sure that the organs and glands have maximum opportunity to heal. So I learned, as an example, you cannot effectively rehabilitate any musculoskeletal problem without a complete analysis of the gland and organ functions because they control the musculoskeletal system. And then when you think about it, watch this. When you are hungry and your stomach's empty, what does it make your arms and legs want to do? Grab food. Go hunting is would be the answer. <laughs> you, you've got to go catch it, right? At Whole Foods, you, usually. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but our nervous system was yeah. wired developmentally. So when we're stomach's empty, all of a sudden we're very motivated to go hunting and we can't fart around, so it really activates the body. When your penis gets hard, what do you do? Cross your legs and just hope some girl's going to fall in your lap? Definitely not. No, you got to go hunting, <laughs> yep. right? So usually when, crawling. Without, yeah. yeah. Without a long, drawn-out explanation, but you can actually look and you will see that there are emotional functions and psychological functions connected to each of your major organs that drive the musculoskeletal system to feed those needs, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So I immediately realized at that point, after in studying lots of research that backed this up, and even people would say, well, where'd you learn all that? I said, well, um, how about um, Netter's Anatomy? I can show you right in Netter's Anatomy. I can show you the exact anatomy, proving exactly what I'm talking right in a standard anatomy text. But it was amazing to me. All these people just completely overlooked it and pretend it wasn't even there. I'm like, what they teach you in school? I would look through this anatomy book and ask him one question. How do the organs relate to the muscles? And I found it in 28 minutes. Um, so what happened was, as I said, okay, I know now that I have got to look in every medical case for any indication of hormonal imbalance, which is glands, things like inability to produce hydrochloric acid, which causes all sorts of problems with the stomach and parasite infections and fungal infections, dot, dot, dot. I've got a, and, and, and whatever I found, whenever I had someone with chronic musculoskeletal problems, 98% of the time I found gland and organ dysfunctions connected to it and they couldn't heal because they didn't have a good enough diet, they didn't have the right nutrition, 
They didn't have enough sleep or rest. They were either over under over exercising or under exercising. Do you see what I'm showing you? I could show why that person wasn't healing, and when I corrected the things to allow the organs to have the nutrients and the rest they needed, all of a sudden spine started to stabilize, pain started to go away, trigger points would clear up magically. So one thing led to another, and I said, okay, well, what would control organs then? So if you look at the map, well, what controls organs is the upper cervical spine. Why? Because the spinal cord goes right through the atlas. Every single nerve in your body passes through the frame and magnum into the spinal cord through the atlas, and the atlas, by the way, turns out to be, there's only two places where you have significant ligamentous connections from the spinal cord to the spinal vertebra. The denticulate ligaments attach to the atlas and sometimes to C2 and the phylum terminale, the tail of the nervous system, connects to the coccyx. So if you have an atlas problem, and then I did tons of research and read piles and piles of studies by the National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association, I literally read every one of their scientific mono, their journals, monographs, for, since they started writing them, hundreds of them, like since 1980-something, and found piles of evidence. Then, then I studied the medical literature, then I studied anatomy, and lo and behold, I found a mountain of evidence showing if the atlas is out of place more than three-quarters of one degree, the denticulant ligaments will put torque through the dura and will disrupt the axonal connections and the synaptic gaps either get stretched too much, which inhibits neural activity, or they get compressed, and slight compression causes neural excitation. So all of a sudden, I was finding that people, for example, that had chronic constipation would get their atlas corrected and instantly start pooping. Right. I've seen many cases of women that had not had a period for six months, a year, two, three years, get their atlas correction, and within 10 minutes would start menstruating because the spinal cord was being compressed or put under traction. So then I said, okay, what happens if the sacrum's out of place? Well, it puts adverse mechanical tension on the spinal cord and can do the same damn thing. So what I'm showing you here is I found, okay, well, if the atlas is out of place, it will override those organs because it'll disrupt the communication between the brain and the organ, and the system cannot regulate itself. It can't compensate effectively. So if you take the same scenario I was just talking about, say the uterus being pro a problem, but the person comes to you with chronic low back pain that won't go away, and then you try to do all the things you need to do to help the uterus heal, and it's not working, if there's an atlas subluxation, it could be stopping the body from responding because even though the brain has the, the body has the resources, the brain cannot regulate the control mechanisms because the communication system is broken. Mm -hmm. It's out of balance. It's being yeah. torqued, right? So then I thought, okay, well, geez, we always have to clear that. So I studied upper cervical pathology. I took courses, advanced physical therapy courses. I I made a deal with all the physical therapists that I worked with for four years because they kept wanting me to teach them stuff. But when I would ever ask them to teach me stuff like Atlas stuff or whatever, oh, you can't do that. You don't have a license. You're not allowed to touch the spine. I'd get all this professional nose up horse shit. I said, okay, I got a, a new rule for you. I won't teach you anything unless you teach me something I want to know. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to share with me, I will not share with you. And some of them were so up themselves, they would never ask me any questions. But fortunately for me, the best physical therapist, I found the best therapists and the best doctors are the most open-minded and play the, don't play the silly games. I've had the, some of the best doctors in the world happy to sit down and swap information with me all day when teach me anything I wanted to know because they knew I was smart enough not to abuse it, right? Yeah. So...